painting on a jar found a Kuntalit Ajrud under the inscription Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah, dated to 800 BCE. Possibly the male and female pair that Herodotus thought was Dionysus and Aphrodite. In an inscription discovered in Ein Gedi and dated around 700 BCE, Yahweh appears described as the Lord of the Nations, while in other contemporary texts discovered in Kir Bet Laya near Lachish, he is mentioned as the ruler of Jerusalem and probably also of Judah, Yahweh, in the form of Yao, is frequently invoked in Greco-Roman magical texts dating from the 2nd century BCE to the 5th century of the Common Era, most notably in the Greek magical papyri under the names Yao, Adonai, Sabaoth, and Eloi. These are also used as Bacchic chants among Dionysian religious revelers at this time. Use of Ya'o becomes blurred by the usage. Since the second century BCE, Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans had identified the evil god Seth Typhon, often depicted as a donkey-like creature with the Jewish god Yahweh. The Seth Yahweh tradition, with all its negative valence, was then applied to the creator worshipped by the Christians as well. Evidence for this view comes from the early Christian depiction of the Creator and his sons in donkey or Typhonian form. The oldest manuscripts of the Greek Septuagint, Old Testament in Greek, before the church editions came in the 4th century, show Yao in them for Leviticus 3.27 and 4.27. These are replaced with the uniform Curios or Lord in the 4th century church codexes of the Sinaiticus, Alexandricus, and Vaticanus. I think it is very possible that we have in Yahweh a warrior, demiurgic craftsman with ancient Bronze Age Dionysian elements passed down through the rites and traditions. Although much closer to something like Vulcan than of Dionysus, this Yahweh the local craftsman metallurgy god of the southern Levant, became infused with El, the chief god of the Canaanites, to become Yahweh Elohim. This also puts him in direct opposition to Baal, the prince and son of El, in the northern Canaanite religion. For Canaanites in the broader Levantine region, El was the highest god, fathering notable gods like Baal and Yam. In Ugarit, El was married to the goddess Asherah, but no temple was dedicated solely to him. Numerous titles and attributes describe El, from being a creator and king to a wise elder. Some myths feature him prominently, such as a tale where he encounters two women by the sea and fathers the deities of dawn and dusk. In an Ugaritic story, El hosts a feast for the gods on Mount Lel, which may indicate he lived in a tent, explaining his lack of a dedicated temple. This text also suggests he might have resided near sources of salt water and fresh water. In the text Palace of Baal story, Baal Hadad, commonly known as Dagon's son, is occasionally referred to as El's son, hinting at El's overarching authority over the gods. Another fragmentary text depicts El inviting gods to a banquet where he gets embarrassingly drunk, showcasing his human-like flaws. Regarding the god El, he was seen as the preeminent deity residing atop the monumental Mount Saphon, where all gods convened, similar to Mount Olympias. Ugaritic texts referred to the collective gods as El's offspring, or all the gods, the divine assembly. El was esteemed with titles such as Creature Maker, the Monarch, the Bull El, and Humanity's Father. Even though royal attributes were primarily ascribed to El, he often came across as a figurehead, sometimes 
distant and inactive, resembling what experts term far-off supreme deity, something like we see in Zoroastrianism with Zorvan. He lived in a celestial realm termed the Sources of the Two Deeps, where he attended to visitors and dispatched directives via envoys, imagined as a kind of elderly figure. El was sometimes named El the Benevolent. Eisfeld suggests that this particular characteristic might have influenced the Israelites to envision their god Yahweh with more compassionate traits. The name El likely stems from the root Yawl, meaning powerful or chief, and is believed to be a descriptive term as referenced by W.F. Albright in his works. The belief system of the Canaanites, a group of Semitic peoples from the ancient Levant, spanned from the early Bronze Age up to initial centuries of the Comet Era. This religion was characterized by the worship of multiple deities and in certain instances, the exclusive veneration of one god while acknowledging the existence of others. The pantheon in Ugarit referred to the deities Elohim, or El's descendants. Philo of Byblos, in the first century Phoenician writer, who cited Sankonietan of Beirut, priest from the Bronze Age apparently, identified the chief creator god as Elion. He was considered the progenitor of other gods. Greek records mention his union with Beirut, symbolizing the city of Beirut. Such divine city unions can also be drawn parallel with Melkart and Tyre, Kamash and Moab, Tanit and Baal Haman in Carthage, and Yah with Jerusalem. El Elyon's relationship with Asherah can be likened to the Greek tales of Kronos and Rhea, or the myths of Saturn and Ops. At about this time, the descendants of the Dioscuri put together rafts and ships and made voyages, and, being cast ashore near Mount Cassius, consecrated a temple there, and the allies of El who is Kronos, were surnamed Elohim, as these same were surnamed after Kronos, would have been called Crony. It was a custom of the ancients in great crisis, of danger for the rulers of a city or nation, in order to avert the common ruin, to give up the most beloved of their children for sacrifice as a ransom to the avenging daemons. And those who were thus given up were sacrificed with mystic rites, Kronos then, who the Phoenicians call El, who was king of the country subsequently after his decease, was deified as the star Saturn, and had by a nymph of the country named Anabret, an only begotten son, whom they call on this account Yedud, the only begotten, still so called among the Phoenicians. And when very great dangers from war had beset the country, he arrayed his son in royal apparel, prepared an altar, and sacrificed him. Kronos also, in going around the world, gives the kingdom of Attica to his own daughter Athena. But on the occurrence of a pestilence and mortality, Kronos offers his only begotten son as a whole burnt offering to his father Oronos and circumcises himself, compelling his allies to do the same. This has obvious parallels to the story of Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac on the altar, but then being stopped at the last minute, which is the polemic against the old ways. The story of Abraham is an obvious euhemerization of the text about El and Kronos, and archaeologists and Canaanite scholars claim that the practice of child sacrifice was rampant among Canaanites in the first millennium BC as is clear from the frequent biblical allusions, as well as from the fact attested by Roman witnesses that the Carthaginians, who migrated from Phoenicia in the 9th and 8th century BC, practiced human sacrifice on a large scale, down to the fall of Carthage. The root of this practice in Punic religion 
is illustrated by the fact that it had not ceased by the 3rd century of the Common Era. Despite repeated Roman efforts to wipe it out, the Babylonians also practiced this due to the ritual of dressing sacrifice victim in royal purple to imitate a substitute king and slaying them in public square. Our best source occurrences are the archaeological remains from the royal death pits at early dynastic Ur from 2600 to 2500 BCE and textual records of the substitute king ritual that was practiced at least from the early 2nd millennium BCE down to the time of Alexander the Great. These rituals were known and practiced far and wide, and El, who was also called Kronos, was at the center of these. Again, would it not have been far better for the Carthaginians to have taken Critias or Diagoras to draw up their law code at the very beginning, and so not to believe in any divine power or god rather than to offer such sacrifices as they used to offer to Kronos? With us, for instance, human sacrifice is not legal but unholy whereas the Carthaginians perform it as a thing they account holy and legal, and that too when some of them sacrifice even their own sons to Kronos, as I dare say you yourselves have heard. And from then on to the present day they perform human sacrifices with the participation of all, not only in Arcadia during the Lycaea and in Carthage to Kronos, but also periodically in remembrance of the customary usage. They spill the blood of their own kin on the altars, even though the divine law among them bars from the rites by means of Parahentera and the herald's proclamation anyone responsible for shedding of blood in peacetime was chosen as a sacrifice for the city, for from ancient times the barbarians have had a custom of sacrificing human beings to Kronos. In Leviticus 18.21 and Deuteronomy 12.30, the Torah contains a number of laws forbidding child sacrifice and human sacrifice in general. The Tanakh denounces human sacrifice as barbaric customs of Baal worshippers. For example, Psalm 106.37. This is another example of the biblical authors detaching themselves from the past of ancient Israel. It is impossible to reconstruct some of the details of Canaanite ritual from references in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 18 describes the contest of Elijah, the prophets of Baal, on the summit of Mount Carmel. The latter are said to have leaped about the altar, to have cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances, till the blood gushed out upon them. The gashing with knives is found in the description of El's mourning of the dead Baal, as well as in the writings of Lucian of Samosota in the second century, who states that the custom was characteristic of the ceremonial mourning of Adonis which was performed annually at the Syrian sanctuary in Hierapolis, also known as the Holy City. Moloch, sometimes written as Molech, was a Canaanite god mentioned in the biblical accounts with child sacrifice. The name combines the consonants from the Hebrew word Melech, meaning king, with the vowels from Bashet meaning shame. In the Old Testament, Bashet is often used as an alternative name for the widely recognized god Baal, who translates to Lord. Moloch is also depicted in the Septuagint in Amos 6 with the star god Rephane. But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Molech and Chion, your images the star of your God which ye had made to yourselves. In the Hebrew, it's Sekoth and Kion instead of Moloch 
and Refane. This text directly connects Saturn with Moloch in the following way. Sikuth is a celestial god recognized from the on-god list discovered at Ugarit, originally sourced from Nippur and various Mesopotamian origins. Here, it's represented as Ninurta, who is the principal deity in Mesopotamian culture that is associated with this planet Saturn, and also acknowledged in the West, and occasionally equated with the god Horon, a god worshipped by the Samaritans. The name Sikuth in Amos precisely echoes this star god's name, its title being Melek or King, suggests the deity's prominent status he becomes the god Moloch in the biblical text. This indicates that Sikuth holds the highest significance in the ritual mentioned by Amos. Meanwhile, Kion correlates with the Akkadian term Kajmanu, denoting the steadfast, the steady one, which is a reference to the star god Horon, who is also equated with Sikuth, is considered one of the most attested deities of the ancient sources who shows up in texts from the southernmost ends of Egypt all the way up to Turkey. He is considered a god of healing, drugs, magic, forbidden knowledge, and doom. A possible forerunner to the serpent in the garden, adding yet another layer of ancient deities that get polemicized in the biblical text. In the Hebrew scriptures, Moloch is depicted as a foreign god who occasionally found a foothold in Israel's religious practices due to the adoption of synchronistic beliefs by some of the unfaithful kings. The divine commandments given to Moses explicitly prohibited the Jews from engaging in the practices of the Egyptians or Canaanites. The edict stated, You shall not sacrifice any of your children in fire to Moloch, thereby defiling the name of your God. Leviticus 18.21 Yet it's documented that influenced kings like Ahaz in 2 Kings 16 and Manasseh in 2 Kings 21, under Assyrian sway, paid homage to Moloch at Topheth, a hilly area just outside Jerusalem. While this site thrived under the leadership of Manasseh's son, King Amnon, it was eradicated during King Josiah's rule who was known for his religious reforms. He is quoted, he desecrated Topheth in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, so no one could use it to sacrifice their son or daughter in the fire to Molech. 2 Kings 23.10 In Canaanite tales, two mountains, Targitsi and Theramagi support the sky and enclose the terrestrial ocean. W. F. Albright suggests that the term El Shaddai stems from a Semitic origin found at the Akkadian words Shadu, meaning mountain, and Shadau, translating as mountain dweller. This associates with one of the Amuru's names. Philo of Byblos also claims that Atlas was an Elohim just as he's a titan in the Greek text, aligning with El Shaddai's mountain god interpretation. Harriet Lutzky offers another viewpoint, linking Shaddai with the Hebrew word sad, meaning breast. This suggests a connection with the Semitic goddess, posits the twin mountains as symbolic breasts of the earth. Dual mountain themes are recurrent in Canaanite lore, similar to Horeb and Sinai from the Bible. The religious beliefs of the Canaanites were shaped by their geographical location, nestled between Egypt and Mesopotamia. These neighboring regions significantly impacted Canaanite spirituality. For instance, during the role of the chariot riding Marianu in Egypt's Hyksos era, Baal began to be linked with the Egyptian deity Set, especially Set's Setaka form. From that point on, Baal's depictions included the crown of Lower Egypt in a distinct Egyptian posture. Likewise, deities like Atheret, later known as Asherah, and Anat, 
started being illustrated with Egyptian wigs reminiscent of Hathor or Isis. From another perspective, Jean Batero proposed that Yah of Ebla, potentially a precursor to Yam, god of the sea, was aligned with the Mesopotamian god Ea during the rule of the Akkadian Empire. The Canaanite faith in the Middle and Late Bronze Age showed evident influences from the Hurrians and Mitannites. The Hurrian goddess Hebat found devotees in Jerusalem, while Baal was often equated with the Hurrian storm deity Teshub and Hittite storm god Tarhunt. When compared to the neighboring Eastern Arameans, the nature and roles of Canaanite gods seemed remarkably similar. Early Amorite invaders of Mesopotamia previously recognized deities like Baal Hadad and El. Phoenician sailors spread Canaanite religious beliefs to the west, leaving imprints on Greek mythology. This can be seen in the division of power among the Olympian gods Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, reflecting Hittite, Canaanite, Syrian divisions among Baal, Yam, Mat, or Marduk, and Ninurta. Additionally, Hercules' labors echo the tales of the Tyrian Melkart, who was frequently likened to Heracles. If we bring our attention back to the Elephantine Jews living in Egypt in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE, we notice that Judaism at this time is still polytheistic. The majority of the Aramaic fragments show either Jove, Yahu, or Kunum as the major head of the pantheon. But some, like this Aramaic text, Carpentra Stella, says, Blessed is Taba, daughter of Tahapi, devotee of the god Osiris, she who to none did aught of evil, by whom no slander whatsoever was spoken. Before Osiris be thou blessed, before him take the gift of water. Be thou his worshipper, my fair one, and among his saints be thou complete. In the top part of the stele, the Egyptian god of the underworld Osiris sits on the throne, recognizable with his characteristic crook and flail. Behind him is a goddess dressed in a long skirt, it could be Isis or Mat. At the table, a lady perhaps, the deceased stands with her arms raised, in adoration pose. In the lower image, the deceased is shown lying on a lion bed. The embalming god Anubis is shown, assisted by the falcon god Horus. The four canopic jugs with the entrails of the deceased are under the bed, with lids likely designed as heads of the four sons of Horus, Imset, Hapi, Duamateth, Kebahesenuf. Nephthys kneels at the feet of the dead, and Isis is shown at the head. 